event in 2018 of Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker up is a 25-year terrestrial radio host come this November, 25th anniversary, with frequent red, uh, red Pill speakers and speakers from this convention like Rolla Tomasi, Richard Cooper, and Jack Murphy. In addition to that, though, when I first talked to him on the phone a few months ago about speaking at this event, I remember you know, hanging up the phone and immediately thinking, the intensity and level of masculinity this guy has is becoming, he called himself a dinosaur about it uh, in this regard <laughs> afterwards, but it really is becoming rare today. And for a variety of reasons, we don't like that. But it's really uh, powerful and almost uh, beautiful in a sense to see it. This level and intensity of masculinity, I think, used to be a lot more normal in America and the West. And it's, uh, it's badass to see it uh, come back at the event. Every year we have a speaker like this, older gentleman from a different generation who brings that to the table. And it's awesome. Without further ado, please help me welcome Pat Campbell to the stage. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning. How's everybody doing? First of all, I'm honored to be invited here. Um, it was about a year ago, I guess, I officially got red-pilled with uh, Rolo Tomasi. I had always been sort of the same mindset, but I wasn't quite ready to make the leap. In fact, his books have been an epiphany for me. I found out that I'm what they call a trad con. And that is somebody, I am, I'm the goon squad for religion. I'm the enforcer. I'm the guy that shames you when you step out of line, or at least I used to be until about a year ago. In fact, Rolo has a fourth book coming out. He's offered me the opportunity to write the foreword for it, but it's all about religion. This is the linchpin to the rational male because religion is the enforcement mechanism for the feminine imperative. I'll talk more about that a little bit later in the program. But when people ask me, what do you do? I used to say I'm a conservative radio talk show host. That's sort of generic, and it tends to piss some people off. Other people go, oh, great. So I, my elevator pitch, and if you go to my Twitter account at twitter.com front slash PC1170, it says, I talk about things that matter with people that care. The reason I'm here today is you are the people that care. And I've got things to say that I think are relevant to this audience in particular. I'm a father of five, and I've got two boys. And I, I'm genuinely afraid for them as to what they're entering into in this day and age. Uh, in fact, I've, I've used the following to explain Rolo's book, okay? Imagine if your son wanted to play football, but he'd never seen a football game, and he doesn't know the rules. And you put him in a uniform, and you put him out on the field, what happens? He's gonna be humiliated, he's gonna be slaughtered, right? So the rational male, the entire series, which I highly recommend, is the, the rule book for playing the game. The game of intergender dynamics. The problem is the women have always had the rule book. We haven't had the rule book or we've been fed a false uh, rule book. The, what, what, uh, what, what Rolo would refer to as like sort of a Disney style princess, you know, one-itis kind of thing. We've been played, we've been played. It's time to wake up. It's time to take the red pill. And if you've got children like I do, I've got five, two boys, but even for the girls, this is relevant. You, you need to read the book and, and you, need, you need to pass on the knowledge. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start here talking about some of the things, just to give you an idea of what I do on my program. Okay, so uh, let's see. About a week, two weeks ago, there was a story in the news about this 35-year-old hulking bodybuilder who beat the living crap out of his living girlfriend who was 21 for about 40 minutes, putting her in a coma, putting her in the hospital, and it was all triggered by him looking at her cell phone, okay? By the way, she went into court and tried to get the charges dropped against him. Fortunately, because there was video evidence that the DA had, what she wanted didn't matter. They're gonna prosecute this guy to the fullest extent of the law, all right? Another little interesting side note too, um, his attorney tried to blame it, he's a competitive bodybuilder, on roid rage. And I said, hmm, that's pretty interesting. Then I took a list, a look at the actual uh, items that were confiscated from the house. 
He had amphetamines, methamphetamine. He had cocaine. He had ecstasy. And he had steroids. But it's the steroids that did it. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is, this is sort of a selective narrative. But it's important to note because it's more of the demonization of testosterone. And testosterone is masculinity. And masculinity, as you know, is what? Toxic. So that's why they nailed that. They don't tell you those other drugs couldn't possibly have anything to do with his crazy behavior, right? So back to the phone thing. And I'm, I'm going to tie this into a story here real quick. Anybody, if you're in a relationship, especially if you're not married yet, we always hear about controlling men, right? We don't hear about controlling women. They're out there. And they are legion. If you've got somebody that's checking your phone, male, female, that's a problem. That's a problem. And if you're not married to that person right now, get out as fast as you can. Because that is like one of the biggest warning flares. Uh, Rolo and others talk about, you know, the, the ink. They talk about the piercings. They talk about the hair color. If somebody's checking your phone, that's a bad omen of things to come. You've got a control freak on your hands, and it's only going to get worse. It's only going to go downhill, and they have trust issues. Get away. Get away. You deserve better. You deserve better. So we had a story uh, a few weeks ago about Bri Bridezilla. So this is a chick who was going to have a destination wedding. And I'm guessing it's probably her second or third, because usually on first time around, you don't do a destination wedding. So she's going to go to Thailand with her husband-to-be. She invites 150 of her closest friends. The cost, $3,000. Please RSVP as soon as possible. Only 15 people decided they wanted to go. That pissed her off. So she changed the destination. I'll make it closer. So she decided, we'll go to Hawaii. It only costs $2,000. This time, only seven people replied. Now she's really pissed off. And, and she, she's, she's got all sorts of demands. It's almost like a hostage negotiation. And uh, then she, she talks about the bridal registry. Oh, she, she, if you're going to go to the wedding, at the bare minimum, you must have a $75 or more gift. Talks about the bridal registry. She says, don't worry about the cheap stuff. That's all been bought. So this is, this is like a prima donna who feels entitled. And I, I wish I could find out who the guy is. Because first of all, man, there is somebody that needs to be red-pilled. I don't care how beautiful this lady is. I don't care how great the sex is. Nothing is worth that. Nothing. And, and, and if that's how you're going to start a relationship, can you imagine where you go from there? That ought to scare the shit out of everybody. So the, the Bridezilla story. Then this ran in, uh, let's see, the Daily Mirror. And it was, uh, the, the copy I've got here is actually from Fox News. I think Bored Panda picked it up too. And this one is a contract that a girl has with her boyfriend that includes 22 demands, okay? So it's like already we're back to a hostage negotiation. I got a gun against my head, okay? If you want me, these are the demands you got to meet, okay? L listen to some of these. These are all warning signs, flares, whatever you want to call it. So number one, you're not to have a single girl's phone number. Really? What about my mom? What about my sister's? What if we have kids and I have a daughter? What if my boss is female? I'm sorry, this is a deal breaker for me. Number two, I love this one. You're not allowed to follow them on any social media, including Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. That's interesting. I've, I've got I mentioned five children. Three of them are girls. My two oldest ones are married. Daughter number two, Rachel, told me something very interesting the other day, and she she sought out somebody as a spouse that was like dad. Okay? So my son-in-law, Sean, is very much like me. He's alpha. And she was telling me that her husband said she couldn't have any male friends on Facebook. And they're like, whoa. And I said, what did you say? And she goes, he's right. And then we were talking about another couple that we know, younger couple in their age group that are married. And the guy, the husband in that case, has an awful lot of female friends on Facebook and Instagram, and which leads my daughter and her husband to believe that, well, maybe he's stepping outside or he's ready to step outside. All right, but with them, it's, it's, not, a, it's not my son-in-law controlling her, but setting boundaries. 
and she wants boundaries. When you're raising kids, kids want boundaries. I was talking with Jack Murphy about a story. My youngest daughter is 15, and she wanted to go to the homecoming. And usually with me, my rule is you don't start dating until you're 16. She's just a couple months away. She's not dating. She just wants to go to the homecoming. They're double dating. So she goes out with her friends to get a dress. Okay, that's mistake number one, because the parents should have been there. And compared to all of her other friends, her dress was the most conservative. But the picture was sent to me, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, what kind of a message does this send to young men, right? Now, the front, I didn't initially think was too bad, but it was a little bit low cut. My youngest brother, I've got two younger brothers. My, my youngest brothers are twins, and they're both Catholic priests. I'm the oldest of 13. So I sent this picture to my brother, Father James. And I said, what do you think? And he, he picks up the phone. He's laughing at me. He goes, are you serious? He said, if her chest was water, she goes, he goes, it'd be pouring out all over the floor. And then, but the, the front part wasn't the bad part. The bad part, you turn around. And I don't know if you've seen what girls are wearing to dr the school dances nowadays, but the, the, am I doing something? It's getting an echo. The, uh, they try to expose the midriff, you know, push the limits. The higher, the better. The lower cut, the better kind of stuff. So on the back of her dress, there's an open space, but the back is also lace, very, I don't know, revealing, and it reminds me of, of uh, lingerie, right? And I'm there like, whoa, whoa, this, this isn't going to work. What kind of a message does that send to a young guy? I know what message it sends to a young guy. And I said, unless, unless I want a grandson out of wedlock or a grandchild out of wedlock, that's, that's a no-go. And I set boundaries for her, and we sent her back to get another dress, which was much more appropriate. But she wanted boundaries. She wanted, she wanted daddy to say no so that I could give her shade, give her cover with her, her friends. You should have seen some of the freaking dresses the friends had on. The girl behind her that took her picture, I'm looking at it. I, 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 first of all, it looks like a negligee, like the shortest negligee I've ever seen. Her mother loved it. Her mother thought her, the other girl's mother, loved it, thought it was great. I, I, I can't imagine letting a kid out of the house, a girl out of the house, dressed like that. But that's what was going on. And again, what message does that send to young guys? I know the message it sends to young guys. That's why you're not wearing the dress, right? But kids want you to set boundaries. So I want to get back to this list here, too. Some of the other things. Oh, she says, you're not allowed to hang out with Keegan including his house or anywhere public. I don't know who Keegan is. As I started to read this list, I'm thinking, what is this, like a 15-year-old boy? Who, who would possibly sign off on this deal? Who would think this is okay? Who would agree to this? But apparently it's an adult. It says, uh, <laughs> and the reason I say that is because they talk about going out drinking. You can't go out drinking without me. Oh, really? That's new to me. It says, uh, you're, not, you're not to uh, go to Honda without me. I, I'm not sure if that's a Civic or what. I don't know what that exactly is. You're not, you're not allowed to hang out with your friends more than two times a week. Says who? Says, you're, you're just dating this chick. You're just dating this chick, and she's setting the ground rules. She's, Rolo talks all, about the, all the time about controlling the narrative, right? This chick, right out of the gate, is controlling the narrative. This guy, this guy like, has been castrated from the start. Uh, oh, you're not allowed to look at a single girl. What am I going to do? Pluck my eyes out? Wear blinders? What do you want me to do? If girls come up to you at any place or any time, you are to walk away. Are, are you kidding me? What, what if my, like I said before, what if my boss is female? What if my coworkers are female? You know, what, I'm not allowed to talk to my mother, my sister anymore. What's, what's the deal with that? Uh, let's, uh, Mo is not to hang out with us every time we hang out. I'm not sure who Mo is. Oh, you are not to ask for head. What, am I supposed to beg? What, I mean, what, what, you're, you're not allowed to ask for a head. That's interesting. You lost me at number nine, honey. You lost me at number nine. <laughs> oh, this one, this one, if anybody gets married, if you do a prenup, you got to get this one. I love this one. I wish I would have thought of this one. You are not to get mad at me about a single thing ever again. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fantastic, huh? I want it in writing. And, and if I can't, if, if you violate that at any time during the marriage, it's null and void. 
You're, you're not allowed to be mad at me uh, about a single thing ever again. Uh, number 11 is on friends. Oh, here's 12. You're not allowed to drink unless I am with you. This, I'm telling you, this, this, is a, this is a chick that's going to be checking your phone. This is a control freak. This is somebody who has trust issues. She may have been cheated on before. She's damaged goods. Get out. Get out now. Oh, this, this, is, <laughs> this is the ultimate deal breaker for me. Number 13. I am allowed to do a phone check whenever I please. Really? Really? Here, here you go, honey. In a pig's eye. In a pig's eye. Somebody's checking your phone. That says they don't trust you. They don't trust you. They're, they're, looking, they're looking for a reason. Maybe they've got trust issues. Maybe they've been cheated on before. Whatever. Anybody's checking your phone. If you're an adult and somebody's checking your phone, that's a problem. That's a warning flare, a sign. Get out. If you're single, run as fast and as far away as you can. And don't look back, lest you turn into a pillar of salt. Uh, 14, if we move in, <laughs> this guy is crazy if he moves in with her, okay? If we move in, well, we don't have to worry about that, right? If we move in, there are never to be girls in our house. What if you have daughters? Do we have to give them up or give them away? What, how does that work? Uh, let's see what else we had here. Uh, but, 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 but. Oh, if we move in together again, which is, which is not going to happen, your friends will rarely be allowed over. If I catch you around girls, I will kill you. Who, who is it? Ahmed, the terrorist, the terrifying terrorist. I kill you. I kill you. <laughs> it's some, some guy, you know, when I read stuff like this, it's, it can't be real, right? This could be like from The Onion. Nobody would be this stupid. But there are guys, there's guys out there that are willing to compromise just to be with women. And some of the stuff is just over the top. It's crazy. Oh, you are not to ditch me for your friends. That's a pet peeve with me. I remember high school, college, and you probably experienced this yourself. A lot of times you'll have friends, they meet that special someone, and all of a sudden it's like they fell off the planet. You never hear from them. You know, if, somebody, if somebody makes you break off friendships, relationships, to be with them, again, that's a warning flare. Get out. Now, if you do that on your own volition, that's another thing, okay? But if somebody's demanding that, making you do that, that's going to be a problem. Uh, but, uh, oh, do, 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 do. Austin, don't know who Austin is, does not control when I hang out with you. Oh, I love this one. We are to go on a legit date once every two weeks at least. Now, I'm not sure what constitutes legit, but once every two weeks. Does this not sound like a hostage demand to you? Seriously. This, this, is, this does not sound like a relationship. My, here's another one of my favorites. Number 20. If I say jump, you say, how high, princess? Got news for you. White guys can't jump. Sorry, I'm out. Oh, and I, this is what I like, because I got in a conversation about this with Rolo on one of my programs. You are to make sure you tell me you love me once a day, once a day, at least, so I know that you're not messing around. More on that one in a minute. And, oh, this, <laughs> 22. You are never to take longer than 10 minutes to text me back. Yeah, okay, yeah. The, uh, the love thing, I love you. So I had Rolo on the program. And what's really weird is I expected initially when I started bringing him on about a year ago, women would loathe him and guys would love him. It was the exact opposite. Women loved him, agreed with almost everything he said. There were guys, trad cons for the most part, who took issue with him. In fact, one, I had two people back in Tulsa that wanted me to cut my ties with Rolo, not bring him on the program anymore. You know why? He talked about his notch count. He's, his notch count, he said he had 40 women. Okay? And that was a deal breaker. I shouldn't be bringing somebody like that on the program. I said, first of all, I said, you don't even have the context. I said, he's been married for like 21 or 22 years. Same woman, right? That was back in his single days. But that's still, that's still well, he's bragging about it. How, how many women did he get pregnant? How many, how many STDs did he get? All this, this crap. Because, because of something he said from, from his past. And it's guys, it's not the women, it's guys that are doing that, okay? 
So I had this conversation about how often should you tell your, your girlfriend, your, your wife, your significant other, your partner, love that word, partner, right? And uh, how often should you tell them you love them, right? And the reason I asked that was because we've all seen older couples, you know, could be married 40, 50, 60 years, and they say, I love you, but it doesn't mean anything anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't mean what it initially meant. It becomes, it becomes like noise. If you say anything too much, whether you say you love someone or you tell them they're beautiful, they're, you know, uh, they're fantastic, if you, you heap too much praise on it, it becomes empty. It becomes, it becomes an empty vessel. It's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And if you don't say it at all, that's a problem too. So where do we go? What's the balance, right? So I asked her, well, and this is the one of the shows where the women sort of turned on him. And he has a two-thirds rule. For every three I love yous she gives you, you only give her two back. And that drove the ladies crazy on the program. What, 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 one of the lines was, what kind of, oh, well, some of the language I can't use, but what, what kind of a, uh, a little person would keep count of stuff like that? Does he have spreadsheets on that kind of stuff, you know? But I, I was trying to find some balance because sometimes if you keep too much praise on or, or say things like that, it, it becomes meaningless, and if you don't, it can hurt them too, and especially with kids, especially with kids. That's it's one area where I disagreed with him. I think he applied that to children too. I just, as a father, I don't see a situation where I would ever hold back telling a child that I love them. That, that relationship is, 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 is very different than a man and a woman. It's, it's, it's a relationship where you're, you know, you're, you're building them, you're, you're, you're growing them. So anyways, that's a little bit of what I do on the radio on a regular basis. When I try to incorporate stories uh, like this into the program. Now, I want to get into a couple of other things with you, too, today. Starting with testosterone. And I've had a couple of conversations here with people about testosterone. For some reason, people think I know something about testosterone. I don't know what it is, a vibe I give off or what. Um, <laughs> but, but anyways, that aside. How many guys here know what their T level is? What's your T level? Do you know your T level? Put your hand up. Do you know your T level? Okay. A lot of you don't. Okay. I'm going to tell you a little story here about my dad. My dad got prostate cancer. And there's a variety of treatments for prostate cancer. One of the treatments my dad opted for was a series of shots, which completely shut down his body's production of testosterone. And when that happens in a guy, when your testosterone goes down, your estrogen goes up, okay? And what I noticed was it completely altered my father's personality. My dad was the strong, silent, stoic kind of guy. When they shut down his testosterone, he became emotional, moody. Uh, he, it, it just wasn't dad. It wasn't dad anymore. He was easily agitated. In fact, I joked around with him. I said, are you watching a lot of Lifetime TV with Ma? He didn't think that was that funny, right? <laughs> but, but that told me a lot about the importance. Here's a line for you. Testosterone maketh the man. You can quote me on that. Testosterone maketh the man. That hormone is so vital, so important to who you are and how you think. Now, I'm in talk radio, and hormone replacement therapy, testosterone replacement therapy is marketed heavily, okay? And they market it mostly as a libido enhancer, which it is. And that's a great selling point, but there's so much more that it does, okay? I've been on hormone replacement therapy, testosterone replacement therapy. Not, people think I do it for muscle building. Yeah, that's nice. It's not, the libido, that's nice. I do it for up here, up here in the head. I noticed when I was about 45, 46, that I didn't feel like myself anymore. I was getting increasingly anxious. I tried to explain it to my doctor. I said, I feel like I've been drinking coffee, and that, that caffeine tension just builds, builds, builds. Plus, uh, I had been a competitive power lifter for a number of years, and I started getting just freaky injuries when I was training. I was doing speed squats in the gym one day, 
and it was a very lightweight. It was 315, light for me as far as that goes. And um, something snapped on like my third or fourth set. I thought I tore my quad. Actually, there's, there's a, a, a clear, uh, almost like a, a package that wraps your muscle, the fascia. Mine ruptured, and the, and the, the quadricep came out. I was like, what the hell is that all about? So I went to my doctor, and he, started, he said, let me run a hormone panel on you. And there's a couple things you need to know. When you, when you go to get checked, okay, don't just ask for your testosterone level, total testosterone. There's another number you need, free testosterone. That is what your body utilizes. If your doctor won't do both, go find another doctor. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. They'll also check your estradiol, which is estrogen. If that's high, that can cause problems as well. Another thing you need to check is your IGF-1. That's your growth hormone levels. Well, my testosterone came back low, and my IGF-1 came back low. And that's why I wasn't recuperating. That's why I wasn't uh, recuperating between workouts, and that's why I was just getting freaky injuries. And once, you get, once they get you on the testosterone, it's, it's almost like a religious experience. It's like you're born again. You feel probably six to eight weeks in, you feel like, wow, I feel like I used to do. I feel like the old me. Now, here's another thing they don't tell you. When you go in for, especially if you're married, okay, if you're married, let's say you go in for hormone, hormone replacement therapy. Say you're a couple, I don't know, 45 to 50. If Papa goes in for hormone replacement therapy, in about six to eight weeks, he's going to have the libido of a 28-year-old. Meanwhile, mama is headed toward menopause or maybe has already gone through it. Those are two ships that never pass. They never pass. That causes problems. So what they're doing now is a lot of the better places are not requiring but suggesting that if you're married or even if you're in a long-term relationship with a girlfriend, that you go in as a couple and, and see what's available for both of you. Have both of you get your levels checked. And now, when it, when it comes to the female hormone replacement therapy, it's a little more complicated. It's a little more complex. But 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 for the guys, you know, that's that's it's marketed for libido, but it's more than that. It's for your it's for your head upstairs. In fact, a couple of people, I was telling them, I had a guest on my program, Dr. Jim Meehan, and I bring him on every week, and we talk about a lot of different things. This week, he he brought in a book. It's called. Estro Generation. That's Estro Generation. This is a book I highly recommend everybody get their hands on. It's how estrogen makes us fat, sick, and infertile. Uh, it's by Anthony G. J. And J is spelled J A Y. And this book talks about a lot of things. Some of them, some of the things that I would expect them to talk about. For example, soy. If you're a guy over the age of 40, Avoid soy like the plague, unless you want to grow, unless you want to sport a pair of man boobs and some nice love handles to go along with it, okay? Soy, soy is, it's kryptonite. It's toxic. It, it, it's the last, it, the last thing you need in your body. <laughs> but when we did this, a guy calls in, he goes, what about isolate soy? What part of soy is no good, don't you understand, okay? <laughs> so I've got a friend at the gym who is probably about 45, he works out religiously. He almost exclusively does cardio. He comes in. He's, he probably weighs about 275. Beats, beats himself up, you know, either on the treadmill or, or the stair climber or something like that, hour and a half every day. He's not losing weight. In fact, he's getting fatter. Okay? He doesn't understand what the problem was or is. So he comes up to me at the gym, and he's all excited because he, he's got something new, and he wants to know if I think it's good. And it's a big tub from GNC. I won't name the, uh, the vitamin store. I'll just give out the, the acronym, GNC. And um, <laughs> he hands it to me with a big smile. He says, is this any good? And I look at it. It's got soy in it. And I said, well, it depends what good is. I said, if you want to grow your boobs bigger, yeah, this is the thing to take. <laughs> and what he needs to be doing, and some of, the, some of the other people that are here that are into training, AJ Cortez and others will tell you, uh, if you're over 40, you need to emphasize lifting free weights. That's what's going to be really good for you, long term. Yes, you need cardio, some cardio, but you can kill you. If, if you're a guy and you weigh over 200 pounds and you're still running on a regular basis, whether it's on hard pavement, a track, uh, even a treadmill, sooner or later it's going to catch up with you. It's either going to be your knees or your hips. Okay, 
They're, 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 it comes with a price, comes with a cost. And, and the free weights, getting into the free weights with some cardio is the way to go to get yourself in better shape. And hormone replacement therapy can play a role in that as well. But this estrogeneration, okay? So they're talking about soy in there. Now here's the one I completely was caught off guard by. Flax. Flax. Flax is sold as healthy. Flax is supposed to be great for you. Good for your heart. Uh, good for, for uh, if you're taking flax seed, good for elimination, all sorts of things. And it's rich in omega-3s. Well, flax is also another big offender when it comes to estrogen. They, they've got everything laid out in this book. These, you, if you're a guy, over 40 in particular, and you want to avoid anything that can raise your estrogen, you need this book. They got the whole list in there. Again, it's called Estrogeneration, How Estrogen Makes Us Fat, Sick, and Infertile by Anthony G. J. And the last name is spelled J-A-Y. <clears throat> Looking at my time here. Okay, so I want to talk about mindset. Here in the United States, well, in North America, just in general, guys, men, it doesn't matter what generation you're in, we've been trained to think that women are the prize. Women are the prize. It's the it's the Disney fairy tale, you know, your sleeping beauty, your uh, snow white whatever Disney figure you want to pick, okay? And, and the girls are the prize. I, I'm here today to tell you something radically different. I'm calling for a paradigm shift in your thinking. And once you get into this paradigm shift, things will begin to change for you. The girls or the women are not the prize. You are the prize. If you're a guy, you're the prize. Women often complain that they're seen as sex objects, okay? Guys are success objects. And here's the interesting part. You need to invest in yourself. Everybody that's here today is already doing that, okay? You're making an investment, a big financial investment in yourself in improving yourself. That is going to increase what Rolo calls your sexual market value. But you need to realize that you're the prize. You're the catch. It's not the other way around as we've been trained to think over the years. And once, once you make that shift, Things are going to begin to, to radically change for you. Now, when I started reading Rolo's books, there were a couple things that jumped out at me that, that really, it's like, woo, made me think. So one of his first clients that he worked with was a guy, and I may mess up the story a little bit, but it's okay because I, I'll keep the important things in here. A guy that was about 65 years old, been married for, I don't know, 45 years, something like that. He's, his kids are grown up, they're out of the house. He's in a sexless, loveless marriage. And, you know, so here he is at the tail end, doesn't really have a lot of time left for whatever reason. I'm not sure if there were some health issues or whatever. But he's done everything the right way. He's done everything the way we've been taught to do it, men have been taught to do it. I don't know, at 65, he may have been one of the guys that waited until he got married to have sex. He's been faithful to the same woman for 45 years, okay? He's, he's always taking care of his wife. He's been the, the, the breadwinner, the bread earner. He's taking care of the kids. The kids are grown up. They're out of the house. Maybe they don't want to talk to him anymore. Who knows, right? But he's still with the same lady because of a commitment he made 20, well, no, 45 years ago when he was probably 20 years old. So Rolo raises this question, and it's a question that upsets a lot of people, but it's a question every guy needs to ask himself. And I, I'm going into the future because I don't want you to get yourself in that position. I want you to avoid, especially the guys here that are in their 20s and 30s, avoid this mistake. Okay? Avoid this mistake. So here's the guy. He's been true to his word. He's been faithful. Maybe she's been just an absolute bitch to him. The marriage has been sexless for a long, long time. And what does he get at the end? What does he get? A freaking participation trophy. Congratulations. You fought the good fight. Here's the hole in the ground. Climb in. Let's hope something's on the other side. I, I don't want you to be that guy. I don't want you to be that guy. Yeah? So the question ra is raised, who do you have a greater duty to? Who do you have a greater responsibility to? Does he have a greater responsibility to the woman that he married 45 years ago or does he have a greater responsibility to himself? 
And I read that and I'm thinking, wow, that's deep, that's deep. The answer, by the way, a little cheat sheet here, the answer is you have the greater responsibility to yourself. You've got to take care of yourself first. You've got to work on yourself first. You've got to improve yourself first. You've got to make yourself number one. Now, some people, especially women, who go, oh, man, that is so selfish. That is so selfish. But compare and contrast here. How many times have you heard women tell other women, honey, you got to take care of yourself. You need to take care of yourself because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of everybody else, your husband, your kids, that kind of stuff. That's perfectly okay. That's empathy. That's sympathy, right? But if a guy says it, oh, he is a selfish, narcissistic bastard. But the reality is your, your, your greater duty, your greater responsibility is to yourself. Because if you don't take care of you, and by take care, let's, let's talk about what that means. So Rollo talks about sexual market value, when women peak, when guys peak. He is of the belief that guys shouldn't even think about getting in a long-term relationship or even getting married until they're, I think he goes as high as 35, okay? I'll compromise a little, 30, 30. In this day and age, 30. And there's a reason for that. Women mature more quickly than men do. And I'm not just talking about physically, okay? Guys, there's a lot of guys, and you know them. Some of you in here may be them that are in their 20s that are still, I don't know, in their embryonic phase. You still haven't figured out who, who the hell you are, where you want to go, what you want to do, okay? If you, don't, if you don't have the answers to those questions, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know where you want to go, if you don't know what you want to do, you have no freaking business getting yourself married or in a long-term relationship. And, and, your, and your sexual market value is jack squat if you can't answer those questions. There's a lot, of, a lot of guys, younger guys, and I know millennials get picked on a lot, who don't really care about a lot of things. I mean, they, they'll go to work if they work at all. They'll just put in their eight hours, whatever, their 40 hours a week. They're more happy just to go home, play video games, or, or maybe they're still living with their parents. It, it's like they didn't grow up. And we've, what we've done here in this society is we have created a culture, especially with parachute parents, where we have what I call perpetual adolescence. You don't have to grow up anymore. You don't. You don't have to grow up. And there's a lot of people out there that haven't grown up, people that just stagnate. Share a quick story with you. Um, I'm a big reader of books. And anytime I'm around leaders, whether it's political leaders, business leaders, any guest I have on the program, I always ask them, sometimes on air, sometimes off, what are you reading? Okay. What are you reading? Because I have found that really successful people are readers. They're avid readers. They're always reading books, okay? Reading reading's an amazing thing. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Brian Tracy, Canadian, who's written a couple of books, two that I would recommend. Well, two that I would recommend. One is Goals, How to Get Everything You Ever Wanted Faster Than You Ever Thought You Could. It's, it's not success porn. It's not pie in the sky dreaming. It tells you how to get things done and how to take action. And the other one, which was an epiphany for me, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. Both of those by, by Brian Tracy. And th we, they get into the mindset. So, so guys, guys need to be working on themselves, especially in their, their, their 20s and even in their early 30s, becoming who they're going to be. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't done that, you've got no business getting into, into a relationship uh, with anyone. So uh, Rolo's got a, an article. It's up on the Rational Mail. It's called The Paradox of Commitment. And it's something every man should ponder. And it's a question only you can answer for yourself. But society, society shames you. If you put yourself first, you're bad. That's toxic masculinity. If a woman puts herself first, that's good. That's the feminine imperative. Oh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, I, I, I was talking about the paradigm shift before, a fundamental change in approach uh, or underlying assumptions. Our culture teaches that women are the prize, and that's backwards. We've got to reprogram your thinking. You are the prize. You're the high-value male. Oh, here's another one. Do not, do not, do not 
And if I get invited back next year, I'll have a story to tell for you. Do not, do not under any circumstance date, or God forbid, God forbid, marry a single mother. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let me, let me define that for you too, okay? Single mom used to mean something, but it means something very different today. Single mom used to mean a woman who had a child out of wedlock. That's specifically what I'm talking about, okay? Do not, do not date, do not marry a single mom for a variety of reasons, okay? First of all, if there's, there's children involved, it is a cruel trick to play on them. Uh, Rich, Rich Cooper talks about being in a relationship where I think it only lasted about three years with a woman. He got emotionally connected with those kids, and, and when it breaks up, she pulls the plug. That, 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 that's like cruel and inhumane treatment, not only to Rich, but to the kids as well. And the, the other thing is, no, no matter how you handle this, okay, even, even if you marry the woman, even if you adopt the child as your own, okay, the reality is you're always going to be raising somebody else's son or daughter. Then the other thing to add to that is a lot of people go, well, yeah, but once they're 18, they're out of the house. I'm here to tell you <laughs> that ain't the way it works. That's not the way it works, uh, especially if you've got a bad apple. If you wind up getting a bad apple, that bad apple can haunt you till he's 30, 40, 50. He could be a thorn in your side for the rest of your life. I'm telling you what to avoid, what to avoid. So in, in Rich and in, in, uh, Rolo talk a lot about that too. And, and, and now single mom means something different. Single mom can mean somebody who's been married multiple times, has kids maybe from different relationships, but when I'm talking about it, I'm talking specifically about a woman who's had a child out of wedlock. There used to be, there used to be a societal sense of shame attached to that. That was bad. You didn't do that. All of that changed right around probably, I want to say, early 80s with Madonna, Papa Don't Preach. Then it became a really cool thing. Having a kid out of wedlock, that's stylish. That's fashionable. You're in with the in crowd. Everybody wants to be stylish, right? Well, there's consequences that come along with that. Plus, it's, 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 it's cruel to the kids. It's not fair to the kids. Uh, Rolo talks about controlling the frame. I've got a phrase I use on the program all the time. He who controls the language controls the debate. Okay? I'll give you a perfect example. Abortion. I don't want to get into a discussion of abortion today, but going back to Roe versus Wade. The people that were pro-abortion quickly took control of the language. You see, they're not pro-abortion. They're, they're, they're pro-choice. That sounds great. I mean, who would, who would be against choices? Well, unless, of course, one of the choices is killing the baby, right? And the people that were pro-life, the people that wanted to spare the life of the child, they're, they're anti-abortion. They're anti-abortion. That's bad. That's bad. That's a perfect example of somebody controlling the language and controlling the debate. And the pro-life community has really been on the run, trying to make up ground ever since. But they got it right there out of the gate. That's something that has applications in your life as well. The uh, I want to do more on that too. The oh, uh, one of the things I love. Let me see if I want to put that one up there. All right. In fact, if you go to my Twitter account at twitter.com front slash PC1170, this is one of my favorites. Don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do. Don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do. Why? Because our actions always, always, without fail, betray us. Always. I love it when politicians talk to me about, we're going to be the most transparent administration ever. Let me translate that for you. You're not going to know jack shit about what we're doing. Okay, it's it, it. People can tell you all sorts of things. You know, I love you. I want you. I need you. But what do their actions say? Always watch people's actions. Their actions always betray them. They always give them away. People could whisper all sorts of sweet nothings in your ear, and and uh, what they do is a completely different story. Completely different story. 
There was another phrase I wanted to get in here, and I'm looking around for it. Bear with me for one second, please. Oh, doo -doo 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 -doo. oh, oh, oh this is it. This is, this is Rolo Gold. And you'll also find it on the, uh, uh, the Paradox of Commitment article. This one, when I read this, it was like a two by four in the face. And they're like, holy crap, man. Whatever you cannot say no to is your master and makes you its slave. Let me say that one again. Whatever you cannot say no to is your master and makes you its slave. So what is it you can't say no to? You know, there's so many things out there that are drugs. For some people, war is a drug. For some people, sex is a drug. For some people, drugs are drugs, right? So what is, what is it you can't, you can't say no to? Whatever you can't say no to is going to control you. And if it's sex, okay, if it's sex, we're almost back. We tried to figure out how that kid could sign off on the 22 demands by the chick. Well, if sex is your God, okay, if sex is your God, it controls you. You're going to sign that because that's what you have to have. That's what you need. That's what you want. Let me go off on a little uh, tangent here, too. Um, Socrates' speech the other morning made me start thinking about what's really important. And I can't remember whose website I was on. It might have been. I think it was Roosh. So I'm looking on the side, and there's books I can buy. How to date a porn star. I'm going, okay, why would I want to do that? Or how to date a stripper, right? I'm going, ah, why would I want to do that? That's like going, you know, how to buy a high mileage car. <laughs> when, when I worked here in Orlando, I worked for uh, 540 WFLA. That's their talk station. And we had, there's a, uh, an FM station. They got the monsters in the morning. And because of the fact that we're all in the same building, almost daily there were strippers in the building. They would bring a cavalcade of strippers coming through. Almost every one of those girls was a train wreck. There was something wrong. They were damaged goods. They had been molested as a kid by, by their father, somebody, someone, somewhere along the line. Most of them were drug addicts. And I got news for you. At 6 o'clock in the morning, they look like shit, especially without the makeup, because they probably didn't go to bed until about 3. But I, the idea that somebody wants to date them, you know, other than to say, yeah, I did. You know, that's, that's Donald Trump was Stormy Daniels. You know, come on. You, you've got Melania Trump. She's a 10-plus, right? Why, why would you want to be with Stormy Daniels? She's, she's an aging porn star. And I love the way they try to dress her up on TV, you know, adult entertainment performer. You know, like it's a, it's like it's a, noble, it's a noble profession or something like that. But if, if, I'm, if I've been disappointed with anything with Donald Trump, if the Stormy Daniels thing is true, that's where it is, right there. It's like, Donald, come on, man, come on. Seriously? What were you thinking? Apparently, it was right after Melania had her son, too, or their son, which was a little weird. A little weird. The, um, so, the, so the controlling stuff, I lost my train of thought there, with, uh, oh, the girls, the girls. Okay, so Socrates' speech. So what do you want? What do you want? Why are you here? What do you want? What are you looking for? What's your drug? Okay. Do you want a 10? Do you want a 10? Is that, is that, gonna, is that what you're looking for? When it, when it comes to women, when it comes to chicks, do you want a 10? Okay. Well, 10s come with a price tag. Okay. And although they might look good, you know, his arm candy might make you look good. You know, when I look at Donald Trump, oh, I saw a picture of him next to his first wife. He looks old. Saw a picture of him next to Melania. He looks a lot younger. Melania is window dressing. Melania compliments Donald Trump. She makes him look younger. She makes him look better. Okay? But what do you want? What do you want? Do you want a 10? Okay? Is, that, is that what's going to make you happy? Do you have any idea what it's like to have a 10? If you want to get a 10, you should probably talk to somebody who has a 10. I don't. Okay? I don't, I don't want a 10. Trust me, buddy. I don't want a 10. Okay? You need to talk to somebody who's got a 10 and find out what the price tag is that comes with that. If you watch any of the, the shows, you know, Housewives of Orange County, any stuff like that, those are women that at one time were considered trophy wives. I'm not sure what century, but <laughs> they, were, they were trophy. And, and, you, and you look at them, there's, you know, there's, we say that women are sex objects, but they can be so much more. 
things you need to look at when, when, you're, when you're out there, and I tell this to my sons, temperament. And I'm not talking about temperament like we do with pets. You know, that dog doesn't have the temperament to be around kids or something like that. Their temperament. What, what, kind, of, what kind of a woman is she? Is she a drama queen? That's a no-go. I mean, that's, that's just going to create all sorts of headaches for you. Is she high maintenance? You know, you start breaking down. I was listening to some of the ladies that I work with in the radio business. We're in the sales department. And they were talking about what it takes to get them to look good to go out to sell the radio, which is amazing because radio you can only hear, but they got to look good to go out and sell it. But you start, you start with the nails. You start with the eyelashes. You go with the hair. All the makeup, everything that goes on, the outfits, the clothing. Man, you're, you're, talking, you're talking a lot of cash just to make her look good to go out on the street. And in and, and, and the drama, the social circles, uh, one of the things I tell my boys, and one of the things I used to do when I was dating, a lot of guys want to meet the dad, right? Not me. I want to meet the mom. I want to meet the mom uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, a uh, buddy of mine, Joe Wachter, longtime mentor, used to tell us when we were kids that if you're going to date somebody, uh, get a good look at the mom. Why? Well, because in 20 years, that's what she's going to look like. And I said, Joe, you've got to be kidding me, man. And lo and behold, uh, we had a family that lived down the street from me, and their youngest daughter was the same age as me. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Just, I mean, she was a 10. She was a 10, right? Just drop-dead gorgeous. All, in fact, all the girls were. Fast forward 20 years later, I stopped over at my parents' house, and there standing before me was what I thought was the ghost of her mother. Honest to God, she looked exactly like her mom. And I'm thinking, how the hell is that possible? How is that possible? Now, that doesn't happen with every woman. But the other thing I want to meet the mom for, and I tell this to my boys, is, first of all, mom's got to like me. Okay? If mom doesn't like me, that's going to be a deal breaker. Because that's, that's going to cause problems if you're going to get married, even if you're going to be in a long-term relationship. Then I want to find out about mom. Is mom one of these moms that's overbearing, that's going to be at the house all the time, that's going to be meddling in my life, okay? Because if any of those, the answers to any of those are yes, sorry, got to get out. Got to get out. Those, those are all danger signs, warning signs. So when, when, when Socrates was talking about, you know, women, what, what are you looking for? If you're looking for that 10, you better make sure that's what you want, Okay. And you better make sure that you're willing to pay the price. And is it really worth all the time, energy, and effort? I've, because of my job, I've had a, an opportunity to be around a lot of alpha males, business leaders, you know, people like that. And, and <laughs> it's amazing. When I went to my dentist a couple weeks ago, it's in a rather affluent community. And there's tennis courts right across the street. And I see three gorgeous tan Barbie dolls over there. All trophy wives. You know, they're little Beamers and they're, they're little Mercedes. Meanwhile, daddy's off at work killing himself. And who knows, they're probably banging their tennis instructor, right? But is that, really, is that really what you want? Is that really what you need? And are you willing to pay the price? Or, or do, you want, do you want somebody, here's the deal. If you're marrying a woman or even getting in a long-term relationship with a woman based solely on looks, based solely on her sexual performance, I got some bad news for you. It's got a limited shelf life. And when it's gone, what are you going to have? What are you going to have? What's left? You need somebody that's more than that. You need somebody you're compatible with. You need somebody who you have something in common with other than sex. You need somebody that's going to uh, be a friend somebody that's going to be a good mother, somebody that's going to nurture your children. And the chick you met at the bar the other night that's crazy in bed probably isn't that person. Probably isn't that person. I'm just checking the time here because I want to leave some Q&A for you guys too. Oh, i got to tell the Rolo story. Oh, boy. So I had a couple people that want me to get rid of Rolo. You quit bringing him on the program Friday, or I am out. In fact, somebody even wrote my boss and said, either get rid of Rolo or get rid of Campbell. And I say, is it too much to ask for both, right? <laughs> so I go on the following Friday, and I told Rolo I would say this here. So I've been on the radio for 25 years, long time. Interviewed some very famous people. 
Had a lot of high profile guests on the shows over the years. Good guys, bad guys, right? Rolo Tomasi is the only person I can tell you, I can look you in the eye, okay, and say Rolo has saved lives. What am I talking about? I've had two, and there's only two that I know about, there may be more, two guys called the, pro well, one called me off air because he's sort of high profile in the community, doesn't want this publicly known, his name known. The other guy uh, sent us a PM when Rolo was on. Two guys that were about to pull a Kurt Cobain. They were going through the express checkout lane because they had both been zeroed out by their wife. They were in Anthony Bourdain territory. They were seriously committing, or seriously uh, thinking about committing suicide. One was much closer than the other. But because of Rolo, listening to him on the program, subsequently reading his books, okay, they found out what happened to them, how it happened. It made sense out of something that didn't make sense. Both of these guys were between 40, 45 uh, businessmen. One's got some political stuff going on too, but business guys who were out there building their dream life for their significant other and their kids. Meanwhile, you know, the, the I guess the romance is gone. The desire is gone. He says, genuine desire cannot be negotiated. The thrill was gone, as B.B. King used to say. So they're out on the side getting a little other action, and, and the husbands find out. They're, 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 they're destroyed. Their whole life's been turned upside down. And then even when they get into the courts, they still lose. They're screwed. So Rolo Tomasi saved their lives. I, I can't say that about any other guest I ever had on the program. And I know that he's had people come up to him at the 21 convention before who, who tell him, point blank, you saved my life. Because of you, I'm still alive. That's a very powerful testimony. Very powerful testimony. And that's why I'm going to continue to bring him on the program every Friday. And if you can't listen in real time, we put the podcast up there at uh, talkradio1170.com. But if you go to Rolo's page, he's got a little uh, uh, Talk Radio 1170 icon. You click that on. All of the programs are archived there in, in the order that we've recorded them. He's been coming on now for, I think it's going to be a year in November. So that concludes my speech. If you've got questions, let's line up. So hey, hey Pat, um, thanks for the speech. It's right here. I'm here uh, on the yeah on your left side. What's what's your name? Uh, Andre. Okay. So like I'm I'm curious um, if you like you have a uh, younger daughter if she's like 20, 21, 22, and she starts dating a 35 year old guy, how would you react? I'm just curious. Uh, well, given the bodybuilder story from two weeks ago, not real good. <laughs> um, I, I I don't know. You know it's it's interesting because I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are the buckle of the Bible Belt. And in certain religious circles, in fact, in the Pentecostal church, there's a lot of situations like that where um, you'll have a girl maybe just graduates from high school, and all of a sudden she marries an older guy that's maybe 30. 35 is pushing a little bit, you know, 30, 31, 32. It's not that unusual. It's almost like an arranged marriage through the church. And... On, on one hand, I, I guess it fits some of Rolo's criteria that the guy, the guy is older. Hopefully, he's successful. He's found out who he is. And at the same time, the, the girl being younger, that age difference, you know, is, is perfect for, for childbearing. Uh, it, with me, though, as, as dad, I want to meet the guy first. It's all going to be based on what the guy's like. But it's really not that unusual in certain circles. Does that answer the question? Pat, great program. I'm a new fan of yours. Um, What's your name? Uh, uh, Kevin. Kevin. Um, I've been having uh, on testosterone replacement for about eight years now. Uh, Axeron, very expensive. I right. switched to the injections. Right. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, the nurse who showed me how to do the injections asked me about uh, estrogen, if I had it tested. Right. I've never had it tested. A month later, I had my testosterone was high and my estradiol was high. Should I be concerned? 
How high was the estradiol? Uh, the range is 20 to 40. I was at 46. Now, that's that's not super high. Hold on. In fact, I, I jotted down those numbers down here because that was something I was supposed to talk about with the exact numbers. I want to answer that question. Yeah, where'd I put it? The, hmm. Anyway, with here's the deal. With your total testosterone, the number is supposed to be somewhere between 300, and they recently dialed it down to 890. By the way, this is not medical advice, okay? If I had an MD by my name, it would be medical advice. <laughs> Uh, the number for your total testosterone is supposed to be somewhere between 300 and 890. Those are the new guidelines, okay? When I started hormone replacement therapy, they would take you as high as 1,200. You will find some doctors that will still take you in the 1,000, 1,100, or 1,200 range, all right? That's where I like to be. That's the optimal level for me. You don't want to go higher than that, and here's why. Because that's when the side effects start to compound, all right? Then the other thing you need is your free testosterone. That's what your body can actually utilize. And those numbers, don't quote me on this, but they're somewhere between 40 and 244. Estradiol, I think the cutoff is 44. I would not be concerned about that if it was up at 100 or maybe more, okay? When, when you're doing testosterone replacement therapy, you really need three things. Testosterone, okay, followed by uh, Arimidex, which is an anti-estrogen. It's actually a drug they use on women who have had breast cancer. And if you're on a low dose, let's say you're on 150 milligrams of testosterone sipinate per week. A doctor usually will put you on 0.5 milligrams of Arimidex twice a week, Monday and Thursday. That keeps your estrogen levels under control, okay? And the other thing they want to put you on is HCG to keep the gonads healthy, right? Those three things in conjunction are what they like to get you on. There's, there's some other clinics around that will also include growth hormone. And I will tell you this, real growth hormone is expensive in the States. For like, in fact, I was telling Rich Cooper for about an eight-week run, it's, uh, I want to say about maybe $1,200. So you got to be well healed, okay? But here's the deal. I remember uh, Sylvester Stallone. Everybody knows how he looks. He's 71, 72. Anybody want to look like him when you're 71 or 72? I do. I do. Since he's 40, he told this to Matt Lauer on the Today Show when Matt was still there. Since he's been 40, he says, in his opinion, every guy in the United States over the age of 40 should be on two things, testosterone uh, replacement therapy and human growth hormone. Okay. Now, here's the downside. Here's the caveat, the warning with growth hormone. I don't know anything about your family background, your genetic makeup. Okay. You could have dormant cancer cells lying in your body. Okay. You could wake them up. You could be pouring you know, gasoline on them with growth hormone. So that's something that everybody has to take into consideration, think about individually, and discuss with your doctor. But there's a lot of clinics now that are doing all of those things together. I've seen guys that have been on both, okay? The, the testosterone replacement with growth hormone, is, there's a synergy there. It's like, wow. The two combined, the two separate are okay. The two combined is like, wow. Then that's why Stallone looks the way he does. All right, thank you. Yeah, when you talked about people refusing to grow up, uh, it, it raised this question for me that's happening nowadays. You know, my, my grandfather walked to two miles to school each mm -hmm. way. I can remember being left in the car alone with the motor running, and I've lived to tell the tale. Nowadays, if you let your kids do anything unsupervised, yeah. somebody's going to call Child Protective Services. Yeah. Uh, what can we do about this? Well, what I'm talking about is guys that are already over 18, okay, that, that should be moving towards adulthood. And I, I think... I think what you're talking about there, too, that we've, we've got a lot of this, what I call parachute parenting, where they're, they're, they're monitoring everything. And there's overkill, too. There's, there's, there's such a thing as balance. You know, there's certain things you need to be aware of, certain things you need to watch with your kids. But at some point, you got to gently nudge them out of the nest. And in a lot of cases, that's not happening. And, and parents really are enabling what I call perpetual adolescence. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's probably the best I can do right now. I got a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old boy. Uh, can you talk more about strategies to introduce this body of knowledge to young men? The 17-year-old, I would put the rational male on his hands, for starters. And that may not go over real well with the wife, but that's okay. Uh, it, 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 I'm, I'm serious. It's, it's the game plan. The, our boys are, first of all, boys are being taught, Rolo likes to say, as defective girls in our schools. That's how they're treated. 
Okay? And it, it's true. I used to be a teacher. I used to be a math teacher years ago. And when I, when I start thinking back, I'm going, especially in grade school for me, K through 8, it was almost all female teachers. Now, I was lucky in that when I went to high school, I went to a preparatory high school. It was all male teachers. So I, I didn't get the female imperative in high school. I got guys, alpha guys, teaching me. And, and, and that made a, made a big difference. But with, with the boys, uh, the 17-year-old in particular, I would get the rational male in his hands, and you're going to have to walk him through some of the offensive language, which may not be permitted at your house. But the truths that are in that book hold true. What do we got next? Sam Bada. I've heard of you. Can't you read books. How. how you doing, buddy? <laughs> he, he came out of the hospital just to see us today. It's a true yeah. story. Five weeks in inpatient care. Just got here. Uh, on the testosterone thing, zinc citrate replaces Arimidex. We're getting rid of estrogen. Tessamorelin for body fat. It's a peptide. You want to write it down. Okay. The only place to get it is Empower Pharmacy in Houston. You need one of two doctors to get it. T-E-S-A-M-O-R-E-L-I-N. Shreds body fat. What took me six months to lose this year, I lost 70 pounds this year. Wow. Um, if I had taken Tessa Morellin, it would have taken two weeks. Two weeks? Absolutely. Whew. So a doctor in Madison, Alabama, Gary Adams, MD. Just write his name down. <clears throat> Gary how, Adams, how, how MD. How much of that do you use? Tessa Morellin? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not on it yet. To find out how much, you needed to read Jay Campbell's books. Jay Campbell and Jim Brown. T.O.T. Revolution. Okay. Um, and I only know all this because, you know, I died from a massive stroke a few years ago, et cetera. So I'm in the stroke protocol, which includes everything that he just mentioned, but it also has a side effect of making you into more of a man than you could ever imagine being. It'll turn you into Ivan Throne. Wow. Can't have too many of those. <laughs> so uh, what, I, what I came up here to talk to you about, or to ask you was, um, so in 2004, I was there when Ryan Seacrest, who doesn't have your voice, replaced my good friend, Rick Dees, yeah. who has a voice similar to yours. Um, and for a little while in my voice acting life, not using my real name, I, uh, I consulted stations all over the country, radio stations everywhere. Right. And every single show that was popular across the country, somebody that sounded like you was replaced with somebody that sounded like Ryan Seacrest or less. Hmm. So what is it we are going to do together to get every radio station morning show that panders only to women to start talking on air to the guys that are on stage here. No. Well, you know, you're the, you're the only one. Well, here, a couple things. First of all, the demographics with talk radio. With political talk radio, just talk radio as you know it, whether it's Rush Limbaugh, myself, Sean Hannity, um, uh, Glenn Beck, people like that, the, the audience tends to skew male. My audience is about 70% male. Uh, it can be 60 to 70% male, um, 30 to 40% female. So it's already skewed towards males, but the reality is a lot of guys are afraid to say some of the stuff that I've said today. In fact, some of the guys would be out the door if they said what I said today. I just happen to work for a really good company that's privately owned in Oklahoma. They believe in me. They're happy with my product. They're happy with what I do. But uh, in a lot of corporate radio, whether it's you know Clear Channel, well, it's iHeart now, or, or, or Cox, it's uh, the people that are in charge. The PC police are there. And they're going to they're gonna put the kibosh on somebody like me. Do we have any more? All right, everyone, let's give it up. All right. Thank you very much.